Hi, my name is Michelle Nielsenat, and I am a representative from the Sustainability Committee. And so I'll, on behalf of that committee, I would like to welcome you all to our biannual uh, sustainability contest. And in fact, we were just talking, and we're not even sure what number this is. We've been doing it for several years, and we do one in the fall and one in the spring. And um, we're excited to have you all today. Um, if you did not see it when you came in, if there are students here who need to get um, credit for attending, we have sign-in sheets on, e on either side. So please make sure that you do sign that so that your uh, faculty member knows that you attended. And uh, like I mentioned, I'm part of the Sustainability Committee, and um, this is one of our big events that we put on every semester. And so it's uh, our pleasure to be able to present this to you. So our this, this is the picture that our keynote sent, so I thought I should use it. <laughs> Our, um, our official flyer had her more professional picture, and I thought, mm, I think this gives a clue to uh, maybe personality and to um, her taste for um, the things in the, uh, you know, love of the environment. So uh, Ms. Michelle Zarecki, so I'm a Michelle, Michelle, we're good people, um, is a professor of biology at Moraine v um, Valley Community College, where she teaches general biology, honors biology, and marine biology on campus online and in the field. She's the recipient of, recipient of the college's 2009 Professor of the Year Award, and she is past president of the Illinois Association of Community Colleges, College Biologists, and has um, a release time position for the last nine years at the, as the Sustainability Coordinator of Teaching and Learning, working to help faculty infuse sustainability across the curriculum. Michelle has created facilities with the Sustainability Scholars Program, a one and a half year exploration based professional development program. Um, it, has also facilitate, um, it has also been facilitated by Michelle for faculty and staff at other colleges and universities across the Midwest. Michelle's helped the college um, win awards for the SSP and um, this year. And she regularly presents at conferences and has been the keynote speaker about sustainability infusion and climate change education at national conferences. For the last five years, Michelle has been a consultant to NASA, Jobs for the Future, and the NWF in Sustainability Infusion and Climate Change Education. Michelle has an MS in Ocean Science and uh, with specialization in marine biology from Nova Southeastern University Oce Ocean Oceanographic Center and uh, M.Ed. in Curriculum Studies from DePaul University. So as a marine biologist, she somehow ended up in Illinois. So um, please welcome Michelle. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm very excited to be here. If I can switch over. So hopefully from my bio, you'll get the idea that dreams can come true. I'm a marine biologist, as Michelle said, living in the Midwest. But I get to take students to Belize once a year as part of my dream to make people like you see what the natural environment is like, get inspired by it, and then take that back into your lives and hopefully do something that you're passionate about. So humans. One of the things about humans and sustainability is that we are the first species to have such a great impact on the Earth in a negative way that has exceeded climate change over billions of years in a way that none of these other species have done. So that's the depressing part. I like to stay away from the depressing parts of sustainability and I'd like to focus on the positive parts because I think there is so much positive to see. So I know we all can look at life like this or like that in regard to the future and climate change, but especially what you all are doing and why you're here is that we should really see our futures like this and like that because there is so much hope and there is so much exciting potential. Hopefully today you'll glean even a little bit of inspiration and take that and run with it in your lives. So this is one of the things that I think is really inspiring. In 1983, Gro Harlem Brundtland, she was the prime minister, or she's the prime minister of Norway, and she started to see faults with the environment. She started to see declines in the natural world, and she got very concerned with that as being a leader of a large country. And she called the UN together back in 1983. 
you guys weren't even born yet. And she said, hey, let's get together and let's think about future generations. And she had such a great vision because it wasn't just that she was thinking about the environment and that was her background, but she was thinking about how the environment could flourish while the economy flourishes and while people flourish. And she called that sustainability. So this is one of the most famous sustainability definitions. It's the typical one that people use today and still carries on in the way that people do business, the way people relate to other people, and the way we care for the environment. So if you're not sure about sustainability, there are three spheres of sustainability. A lot of people think that sustainability lives right here in the environment, but it doesn't just live there. It also lives with people, education, community. It also lives with profit, economics, corporations, and where those three things collide is sustainability. So it's kind of thinking about how can we run business? How can we run governments? How can we treat our people well so that they can flourish? And how can the natural environment also flourish? That's what sustainability is. So one maybe easy and more comical way to understand sustainability is let's listen to the wombat. Yo, listen up. This is your home. It's the only one you got. This place is pretty, but you can't live there. You can't even get there. So I repeat, this is your home. It's the only one you got. Cherish it, protect it. It's the only one you're going to get. These guys, they're your neighbors. They ain't going away. They ain't leaving. You have to get along with them. So you have to learn to share. You have to get along. You have to learn to get along. Because they are your neighbors. They're not going away. Okay, all this stuff, the animals, the waters, the sky, the ground, the bugs, the fish, the tacos, the people, they're all connected. Everything is connected. They all depend on one another. If you ignore that, you're doomed. Repeat, doomed. Okay, so listen up. It's all one. Not two worlds, not three, one. Just one. So get it in gear. Remember, all is one. Okay, hit it. <laughs> Some other crazy wombat video is going to come up. I better get rid of this. All right, so I think we can glean a lot from what the wombat said there, right? We've got one earth, we've got one shot to make it happen, we've got one lifetime. So one of the things that I think all of us need to focus on is what are our wants versus our needs, because what do we really need to have a happy life, a healthy life? What do we need to live our life on one earth? What do we need to have a sustainable future? A lot of the things that we say we need, we really want those things, and they have a big cost to future generations, as well as our own. So sustainability, in general, if you think about it kind of in the context of the wombat, there's one earth that we have to take care of. We just have one of each other. We need to take care of each other. We need to treat each other respectfully. When you all go into jobs, you want to make sure that you're doing your job not at the cost of people. Make sure those people are taken care of. And then you also, of course, want to make money, because who doesn't like money? Money makes people comfortable. And I know they say money doesn't make you happy, but it sure makes you comfortable. And comfort does lend itself a little bit of happiness. So you all, being here, you're educating yourself. You're the future. You're going to come up with ideas that will have an impact on your lives today and on future generations. This is what um, the Association of University Leaders for a Sustainable Future have said about higher ed. And the whole idea is, is that higher education is a huge machine worldwide. We can't neglect that when we think, oh, the corporations need to do it all, the governments need to do it all. But higher ed is huge. There are so many colleges and universities in the world. We need to be educating our students so that they understand sustainability. We need to be running our machines, running these colleges and universities in a sustainable way, not hurting the environment, treating our employees, staff, students well, and thinking about future generations. So this is one thing that's really important. Um, there is a huge compact that's called the American Associations of College and University um, President's Climate Compact. 
your president originally, I guess your last president originally signed it. And that's something that if it's important to you, check in with your president and talk to them about that and say, this is important to us. We are thinking about our generation and future generations. You guys have a lot of influence on what happens in the next generation. There's a lot of interesting work that's going on in colleges and universities around the world. You guys are starting here by doing a lot of research and sustainability, doing your presentations, and you can continue on that in your next um, venue onto another college and university, onto grad school, maybe get a PhD. So one job for the future could be being a researcher in a college or university. So why are we talking about sustainability now? Sustainability now, really important because there are so many factors that people are passionate about. So if we take a look at this graphic, some people might say, I want to live a life where there's no poverty or where there's no hunger, where everybody is healthy and has a great well-being. We've got all kinds of passionate things up here that people are pushing for. Why can't we just combine them all into one sphere and then call it sustainability so that everybody is working together for the same common good and helping each other out? So for you all, the sky's the limit. Put all of those ideas into work, into a passion, into a job, into your future. Make some money. Make the world a better place. All of these look like they're kind of sci-fi, but they're not. These are things that are happening right now that are being detailed. Mechanics are working on it. Engineers are working on them. Researchers are working on them. You could be a part of some of these exciting things that are happening. So whatever your passion is, if you have a passion for one of the spheres of sustainability or you've figured out a way to incorporate them all, please follow that path. We need you. The future needs you to do that. So everybody stand up. Just get your blood flowing for one second. So if you have ever done your carbon footprint, you went online and you've calculated out how many Earths Everyone would need to live your lifestyle. Stay standing, meaning that if you haven't, sit down. Awesome. Okay, so we have at least half of you have. Great. So for those of you who haven't, you can sit down now. For those of you who haven't, there's a few places that you can go to calculate out your carbon footprint. These are two great resources, myfootprint.org or thefootprintnetwork.org. These are very enlightening and sometimes a little bit scary because the truth of these can be very shocking to whether um, it is realistic in the way you live your life that we can have a sustainable future or not. So if we take a look at the United States, for example, on average, when people take their carbon footprint, the global deficit is four Earths, meaning that we have one Earth, just like the wombat said, but it takes five Earths of resources if everybody lived your life in the same manner you did. And that's the United States. We're one of the countries that has the biggest impact on the global footprint. UK is about three and a half. You can see Argentina, South Africa, one and a half. And then we get into places in India, not all of India, but some of India, where it's less than a half of an Earth. So they're making up for those of us up here. The world average is about 1.4, which you're like, yeah, that's not too bad but we don't have this point for. We're going way over and beyond. So again, what I challenge you to do is come up with a way to get us all here, get us where China on average is. So a few ideas of things that are happening in the world. This um, is a German company called Archblocks. They've designed houses in a way that are carbon positive. And what that means is that from the design beginnings, to the construction, to the living in this home, there is no carbon emitted into the atmosphere. Not only that, that it actually extracts carbon from the atmosphere. And so it's what we would call carbon positive. It's actually helping to lower climate change or global warming. So come up with an idea like this. Help people out. Help people to live in a way that they are healthier because the research on this type of home says that people living in these Archiblox homes are healthier. Their water is filtered better. Their air is cleaner. So who could want something better, right? You live in a home where you're healthier and you know you're making a positive impact on the earth. This is sun culture. Sun culture works with a lot of farmers in East Africa. And what they've come up with is they've come up with this irrigation system. They come in, 
and they put this cistern in that collects water, and they run these tubes underneath the farm, and it lowers the amount of water needed on that farm by 80%. In many of these countries in Africa, there are great droughts. So this allows those farmers to continue farming even when there are times of drought. What they found is these farms, they make about $30,000 per acre per year. That's a lot of money, and especially for people who weren't making very much money. It's definitely a security system to keep not only farming, but it also it makes that economy thrive. So there again, you see that piece of sustainability that we have something that's treating the environment well, it's making the economy thrive, and what do you think about those people who suddenly have a lot of money from doing what they're passionate about or what they need as subsistence? is they are treated well and they are much better for it. So here's a really great example, another example of sustainability. Here's a real simple one. This is a Swedish company. They came up with the idea that you could subscribe to a clothing company that makes all organic clothing. The clothing is made completely sustainably. The people who manufacture the clothes are treated well. And so um, the whole thing is completely sustainable. They make a good profit. So in the first months of life, the baby gets some organic outfits. When the baby gets a little bit bigger, these get sent in, these get sent out, and vice versa, and you keep going on through the child's whole life. These are reusable, so they are washed and then they are sent out to somebody else. It's simple. It's a totally simple business design. You don't need to have that much overhead. You just have to keep track of how old children are and send them the clothes and the people send them back. So it doesn't have to be difficult like this, for example. It can be simple like that. Here in Chennai, in um, India, they're creating pedestrian-only bike lanes. I know in Chicago, biking's like a really big thing, but the bikes are mixed in with the traffic, and that's very dangerous. So here what they're doing is they're making bike lanes and they're making walking lanes, and that's making for healthier people. It's lowering the carbon footprint of that city, and it's saving people a lot of money in transportation. This is Mobisil. Mobisil, it makes and sells solar systems to people in East Africa so that they can run their households. The way that they are charged is monthly for renting this essentially, and it's all done through their cell phones. So it's very easy to do, and um, it comes with very little cost to the people who are renting them. They're extremely affordable. Families are able to connect with the world in ways they never had before through TV, computers, um, cell phones, they can charge their phones in that way. Not only just connecting with the world, but they can run their businesses. And in running their businesses, you have people who can connect with other people in the next town, in the next country, or worldwide. And they've never been able to do that before. Let's talk a little, a little bit more local. So there are companies in um, western Illinois, northwestern Illinois, that are growing tomatoes. You might think, okay, well, whatever. Tomatoes are always in the grocery store. They shouldn't be. Tomatoes are a summer um, farming product. So if you think about growing tomatoes, especially here in the Midwest, when can we grow tomatoes? Just in the mid to late summer, and then that's it. So should we have tomatoes in our grocery stores in the winter? Well, unless we want to ship them from three to 8,000 miles away. And that seems like a lot, so you can have your tomatoes. So here's two companies that are set up um, Mighty Vine has set up grow houses, and um, I can't remember the name of the other one, which I'll show you a short video, that they're setting up um, housing to make greenery all year long, so salads and other greens. Where's the flash field? All right, so um, regardless, the point is, is that you can do something local. It doesn't have to be one of these examples where it's global. There are many CSAs, Community Supported Agricultural Plans, that you can support, or perhaps you can create based on doing something like these companies here. 
You get people to subscribe to your farm or to a local farm. You could work with a local farm. And you get organic food every, could be every week, could be every two weeks, could be every month, that you get this lovely box of produce. And then you figure out, what do I want to cook this week based on having that? You can go to um, a place called Local Harvest. It's localharvest.org, and you can subscribe to one of those CSAs and support them. Or you can get in contact with a farm in that manner as well. Innovation Illinois, this is an organization that is getting industry and government to work together for better policy. They're working not only with um, governments, they're working with universities and colleges, and they're trying to create better business, uh, better government, and as well as better jobs for people. So definitely interesting if you're you know, looking for, and I saw a lot of this driving down from Chicago, if you're looking to get into like wind turbine work. Here's a great place to start. One of the things that um, you all are members of as ICC is iGen, the Illinois Green Economy Network. There is an iGen resource guide that shows you all of the colleges and universities that have certificates and green job programs. So if you're interested in green jobs, definitely check that out. See where you might go as your next step. Or do some things here. So here at ICC, there's lots of things that you can do locally. You can get these certifications and you can start working in your own neighborhoods or working in your own counties. And then a couple other ones from Illinois, Clean Job Illinois. We're finding that we're already employing over 100,000 people in clean jobs, if you didn't know, in Illinois. Every year we're adding almost at this point 32,000 jobs, so that's pretty promising. And again, you guys can see some of this in your own area with the turbines, but there's also a lot of solar work going on, as well as home housing and heating that you can work in. Uh, this one's an interesting one. I always thought, oh, how nice would it be to live in a neighborhood where everybody participated in sustainability in the same manner? These are what are called agriburbs. There's one in northern Illinois. And the, they have a farm, they share food. You can see that they have regular meetings. It helps to socially support them and it actually economically is far less as being a community than if you're individually trying to live sustainably. This is a great example from Chicago. This is one of my favorite um, examples of sustainability. Sweet Beginnings, it's honeybee farms that are located right outside of O'Hare Airport. There are fields of natural plants that are going to waste. So somebody said, hey, what if we made bee boxes over here and we could have the bees feeding off of all these natural plants that nobody else can use. It's a no fly zone. It's a no housing zone. And they have made honey and honey related products. The great thing about this, the social justice spin on it, is that they are employing former convicts. And it's giving people who have served their time to society and they want to move their lives forward in a positive way, get job experience to live and live sustainably. So it's a really cool thing. Not a huge business plan either. And then last thing I just want to mention in terms of job-wise, one of the ideas, this is a great job if you're, or a great book if you're interested in the kind of recycling of things within a business that what you take out of the earth and you utilize as your thing that you're selling can be eventually broken down and recycled and put back into the earth. And that idea is called Cradle to Cradle. Lots of great examples, lots of great inspiration here in this book. And the sky's the limit with you guys and jobs. At this point in time in life, by the time you guys are done with your undergraduate degrees or graduate degrees, there are going to be jobs created out there that we don't even know what they are today. So you create that job and you live it out, it'll be your dream. We only have one planet and urgently need to find ways of living within its limits. Although environmental regulations are more advanced than ever, our consumption of natural resources continues to grow. The problem is we rely on natural resources to carry out our daily activities, like heating, washing and eating. To develop more dramatic innovations, an alternative approach is to begin with the needs that these activities fulfill, like warmth, cleanliness and nutrition, and then to ask how can we meet these needs in more sustainable ways?
As part of the Consensus Research Project, we put this question to key people working in policy, industry and research, as well as to the general public. Because how we live constantly evolves through time, we asked them to imagine what new technologies, behaviours and policies might be involved in heating, washing and eating practices in the future. Scenarios were imagined, for example, where personal warmth is achieved using body heat vests, while advanced controls allow us to target heat in certain parts of the home. Personal hygiene is maintained by adjusting how we clean ourselves, depending on rainwater availability, using splash washing or gel cleaning when water levels are low or showering when levels are high. Intelligent fridges diagnose our nutritional needs and help us plan sustainable meals using fresh vegetables from community gardens or living walls. From these future scenarios, we worked back to the present, a process called backcasting, to design business, policy and educational steps for the achievement of more sustainable practices. Collaborating like this to design innovations in our everyday practices opens up a range of opportunities to make meaningful advancements towards sustainable living. To find out more, see consensus.ie. So I have a few just last challenges for you. Whatever you do, make the world a better place for you and for every organism on the planet. Whatever you do, be proud of your actions and do great things. This is my son. This is when he was two years old. He's five now. I love this picture because it looks like he's flying and it just makes me think like you can do anything you want to do. If a two-year-old can fly, you can make anything happen. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just curious how your um, position as um, sustainability coordinator is um, structured or supported um, in, with relation to your teaching. Is it like do you get release time? I do. I get release time. I get 12 hours a year. I take three in the fall, six in the spring, and three in the summer. How the, I'm sorry, the what? Sun culture. Um, sun culture, that's the one with the underground irrigation system? Mm -hmm. Or was that the one with the solar panels? The underground irrigation. Yeah, so they, um, what they typically would do with farms and east, well, and, you know, farms in general, is that they water from the top down. And a lot of that water gets evaporated pretty quickly, especially if you go to somewhere like Africa or, you know, middle of the summer in Illinois, we've had some pretty hot days. And that water, a lot of that water just evaporates off. When you put those tube systems underground, the water soaks the soil. Water is absorbed at the roots for plants. And that's where it's key for them to be, for water to be absorbed. Watering the top of the plants is often um, a waste of water and it's also not useful to the plant. Sometimes for uh, like tomatoes, for example, it can actually inhibit their growth if you water the leaves or you get the leaves wet. So it's a more efficient system in that the roots can soak up the water and you're not having that water evaporate off. Um, one of the other ways that they're helping is not only the underground watering, but they have these huge cisterns so that when it does rain, they can capture the rainwater and use that rainwater and collect it to water their farms. So you don't have to use additional water. You can use the water that is already captured naturally. So, okay, so the question I have is if the cisterns are above ground, if it's a really hot day, is the water going to evaporate out of that cistern? They're a closed system that the water is captured and then it goes into a cistern where it's closed. So there's no opening on top. There's like some kind of funnels that bring the water into there. Yeah, good, good question. Yeah, thanks. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing from you all as well and learning a bunch. So thank you for having me. I greatly appreciate it.